Caitlin Donnelly, thanks for joining us. Um, Caitlin is the program director for Nonprofit Vote. She has over eight years of experience designing and leading workshops and presentations for nonprofits and grassroots organizers across the country. Prior to coming to Nonprofit Vote, Caitlin worked at Youth On Board, where she supported high school student leaders in Boston as they work to shape school policy and foster civic engagement. Based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Caitlin manages the monthly webinar series and builds the capacity of organizational partners to expand their approaches to voter engagement. So um, that is why we have welcomed Caitlin and Nonprofit Vote here today. Thanks so much for joining us, Caitlin. Thanks for having me. Uh, yes, I run a lot of webinars. This is actually my fourth webinar of the day. So we'll see if you're getting me at like my perfectly honed best or if you know, I peaked on the last one. I'll let Craig be the uh, one to decide. So. Uh, I will be a very, very kind judge on, on, on webinars. I've, I've been a participant on many. I've never had to host one. I'm sure it's very, very difficult. Well, perfect. Well, Caitlin, I know you have some slides, so I'll let you jump in. And then Craig, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. And um, I know that Caitlin and I have some questions too that we will be asking throughout the presentation. Sure. Uh, just uh, before you begin, uh, one note. I haven't fully mastered the art of the Zoom thing. I'm not in the witness protection program. My, that's not why my face is in shadow. It's the best I could do um, with the setup. I have the window behind me and so. No worries at all. All right. So, um, as Kristen, thank you for introducing me. Um, as Kristen mentioned, I am the program director at Nonprofit Vote. So I am really approaching this from a very nonprofit lens um, in terms of what nonprofit organizations, specifically 501c3s, are allowed to do. Uh, so bear with me as I have that nonprofit centric focus, but no matter. Um, where you work or who you're affiliated with, I think some of the suggestions I offer today um, can fit in for getting out the vote, whether you're doing it in a big group of people or all on your own. So I will just step back just to tell you a little bit more about my organization. Nonprofit Vote is a capacity building organization. Uh, we don't engage voters directly. We try to equip nonprofits that are embedded in their communities, have long lasting trusted relationships with the communities that they serve and help them to engage those folks in voting and elections. Because we know that leveraging that trust um, really makes a big impact and I'll talk more in a second about how big that impact is. But if you're looking for nonpartisan resources for how you do things like set up a voter registration drive, um, you need a script for a voter registration activity, you want to know how you can plan a candidate forum, uh, we have all of that on our website. We also have original research that shows the impact of nonprofits on um, voting and turnout. We also have a handy voting in your state portal. So wherever you are in the country, you can find out about your state's unique laws around voting and elections. So obviously this is a photo from the past, uh, judging by the non, uh, the National Voter Registration Day poster in the back, it's 2018. Um, I think this year we'll all know which year was 2020 because of the masks. Um, but this year, uh, National Voter Registration Day, which was last Tuesday, September 22nd, um, engaged nonprofits as well as corporate partners, uh, businesses, large and small, campuses, student groups, schools, educators, uh, volunteers, and more, uh, led by um, election officials and um, our team in registering over 1.5 million voters. So it was a huge success and a really a testament to what we can achieve by working together. But just jumping back in time for a moment, because we won't know the results of 2020, um, probably we won't know the 
I mean, outcome of the actual elections maybe until November 3rd or later, but we won't know what the turnout looked like until probably spring of 2021, um, like full, good, really good demographic breakdowns. So when we conducted our last study in 2018, uh, we were able to release our report in 2019. And what we found was that the field program we ran, which included about five states, um, 15,000 voters um, engaged, whether they were registered or pledged to vote, um, by almost 200 different nonprofits in these five different states. Um, when we ran the numbers, what we found is that uh, the people engaged by uh, nonprofits were two times more likely to be non-white. They were also about twice as likely to be lower income or younger or have, you know, be part of some group that has traditionally been marginalized, underserved, and overlooked in our elections. Um, so we saw that we were reaching the right people. Um, this is all in our engaging new voters report. So then we wanted to see, well, if we're reaching the right people, are we having an impact on turnout? And it turns out we are. So um, especially for the groups that uh, have the largest gaps, um, we have, we're seeing the highest turnout advantage. So I'll try to break this graph down as well as possible. What we did is we took every voter that was actually contacted by our nonprofits and we found information about them, race, age, county, all these different demographic factors. And then we found the other voters that shared those factors in their county and we compared them. Did they turn out or not? So as we can see here, um, uh, Asian Americans, Asian folks actually had the highest turnout advantage in this program. So um, 16 points higher turnout um, for those voters con that were contacted by the nonprofits compared to voters in their community that were not contacted by nonprofits. So we know this can be a pretty powerful tool um, when nonprofits do engage the people they serve. So if you work for a nonprofit, and you haven't started voter engagement work already, what are you waiting for? And if you don't work for a nonprofit, there's probably one that you can get involved with uh, as, either as a volunteer or some level of support, um, even just plugging into whatever voter engagement work they're already doing so that you can um, attend their forums, um, get on their Zoom events, um, you know, do whatever you can to really demonstrate the value that this has for your community. Hey, Caitlin, I have a quick question before you go forward. Um, when you're talking about the sure. nonprofits that you all are working with, can you give us an idea of what those nonprofits do? Because I'm assuming most of them are not like politically oriented nonprofits, um, or are they? That is such a good question, Kristen. Um, we actually really focus more on human service nonprofits rather than civic engagement nonprofits. So we love League of Women Voters and we partner with them quite a lot. But when we're building resources for our audience, we're thinking about um, the food pantry in Texas. Uh, we're thinking about the after school program in Minnesota. We're thinking about housing alliances. Um, you know, health centers are a great place for this work. We have created toolkits for a number of our national partners and worked with them to really increase their voter engagement capacity. And so we've worked with United Way Worldwide, Feeding America, YMCA of the USA, National Urban League, and others. Um, so we're really trying to help um, nonprofits that maybe voting isn't super mission aligned for them, um, they can still see the value in it and how it does in a sort of broader way support their mission. So we're like, let's give, uh, give them all the resources they need so that this isn't such a heavy lift to integrate into their services. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Great. Uh, so, you know, this year it's been a big challenge for all our partners, the, the biggest ones to the smallest, because a lot of the activities we relied on were in person. Uh, in fact, 
it was really scary back in April uh, and May when we were seeing the numbers of voter registrations just plummet compared to 2016 levels and 2018 levels um, because DMVs were shut down, campaigns weren't doing activities, um, just so many places where voters register uh, are in person. And so with those gone, we all really had to scramble and figure out what does this look like today? Um, and you know, it, back in March, we were doing scenario planning, being like, maybe there will be a vaccine, maybe this will disappear, maybe we'll still all be like shut in our houses, maybe there will be a second wave. We didn't know, um, but we did. We've come up with a lot of things that um, have been adaptable and really workable. Um, so I'm going to get into some of those ideas about actual things you can do. Um, but I wanna talk about some best practices at the top and then more will be sprinkled in. So if you're a nonprofit, you have to stay nonpartisan. If you're not affiliated with a nonprofit, I think you should still stay relatively nonpartisan for a lot of your conversations. Trust me when I say that um, when I was working with um, uh, an organizing group before this versus uh, before this job now here and like using this nonpartisan lens all the time, it is much easier for me to talk to family members I disagree with. Um, so nonpartisanship can really be uh, a good tool. It's, it's, there's actually a lot of um, freedom to agree with people and really listen and explore um, when you're not trying to just drive home your point, your agenda. So what does it really mean to be nonpartisan? Uh, in, a, in a technical sense, especially when we're talking about non nonprofits and IRS restrictions, it means not endorsing or opposing a candidate or party not ranking or rating candidates or implying that certain candidates are favorable and not recommending affiliating with one party or if you're doing a voter registration drive, you wouldn't turn someone away uh, because they had a different belief system than you did. Um, so there are also sort of more passive ways that we can be not, that we can be partisan. Uh, like if we show up to a voter reg drive and we've got a candidate button on, um, that's okay if you're working for that candidate's campaign, but if you're doing it with your local Y, that button's gotta stay at home. Um, I really think that, you know, when we do come to this um, without that, sort of agenda or motive, we are much more approachable um, and we can really hammer home the message that um, we want everyone to participate, everyone's voice does matter and democracy really only works when we're all participating. You also really need to be informed. So knowing, you know, it's good to be nonpartisan, but even if you dis uh, discard that piece of advice, please make sure you're informed, especially about the rules in your state. Every state is different. That's what makes this such a challenging uh, and ongoing kind of activity uh, for nonprofits. Um, especially this year, a lot has changed in the way states are implementing their elections. Um, if unless you've been under a rock, you know that there have been vote by mail expansions, that there have been lines at polling places. Um, there's a lot going on and a lot of changes. So we created these fact sheets uh, for every state. Most states, about 40 states so far are already up on the site. The last 10 are going up pretty soon. Um, and we tried to make this as straightforward as possible. So you're just seeing a corner of it, but we have important dates, information about registering to vote, um, what people would need to know um, about voting in person. So um, I've got Florida up here and in Florida, you need to have um, ID to vote. So that's something you'd wanna make sure that you know as a voter and that other voters know about. Um, there's also information about voting by mail on these fact sheets. Um, they're downloadable. They do have links, um, but we wrote all the links out. So even if you passed this piece of paper to someone, um, they'd be able to type those into their phone or their computer later. 
So we have to adapt our voter engagement to this new normal. We, uh, what you see on this slide uh, are some folks from, uh, I want to, this might be Move Texas, a really great partner of ours and pr like practically the undefeated champs of voter registration day. Um, and they were running a voter registration drive through. And that's one of my like favorite, what I think is like one of the most exciting things that have come out of this year. Um, folks doing these drive throughs It's a way to stay distanced. People can be wearing masks. They're in their own cars. Um, you want to get like your materials in order in line if you're going to do this, like having your forms, pens that people can take away, um, signs with QR codes so that if people want, they don't need to use the paper form while they're waiting in this line, maybe to get a COVID test, maybe to pick up a food um, basket, whatever it is, uh, they can you know, do it from their phone as well. Um, so we have a whole how-to guide on that um, and how you set this up effectively. So if, if you think a voter registration drive-through is something you could do um, with your organization or with a local organization, um, a church would be a great uh, organization to partner with on something like this. You can do it for registration or if the registration deadline is passed for voting by mail as well. Caitlin, I have to say, I think the most interesting idea I've seen here, I live in Arkansas, is um, there is someone who is registering voters and they've partnered with an ice cream truck. So rather than you driving through their uh, setup, they are driving through the neighborhoods and offering a free ice cream and a voter registration form. I'm sad that I am registered to vote. I love that. Um, even if you don't have access to a ice cream truck. Um, some folks are actually doing caravans like that to raise awareness and bring attention and, and meet voters where they're at. So um, we've seen that um, in Cleveland. Um, our partners at Cleveland Votes have done that and um, they were particularly focused on um, uh, Spanish speaking communities and making sure that, you know, that they were being engaged as well, since they can often be sort of passed over by, you know, typical elections department communications and campaigns. Um, another way that people are finding a lot of success this year is pretty old school. It's a phone tree. Um, so if you have a list of phone numbers um, from your organization, a place where you work or, or your faith community, um, you can use that list and phone bank through it to talk to voters. Um, obviously canvassing is very limited if it's happening at all. It obviously depends on the community, but this is a way that people don't even need to leave their house as much as we all really want to leave our houses. Um, they can, you know, from the comfort of their home, they can call through um, a list and get some of that like, you know, person to person contact. So that's really nice. Um, not everyone has a phone list, right? Well, I would really recommend relational organizing and that kind of approach. So uh, instead of a phone tree, it's a uh, it's, it's branching even further. It's like a phone ripple. So every person is supposed to contact a couple more people. And so this is also a really good um, strategy for uh, especially seniors, but also young people and people who are not eligible to vote, maybe because they're not citizens or they're not 18, uh, because they can still encourage people in their lives. They know people who are voters and eligible to vote. Um, so that's a way that they can really be engaged and not left out of this process. And they can, that's a really compelling message to say like, I can't vote, but you know, here's what I you know, want out of my community. I want my community participating. Um, I care about these issues that our, our community is facing and you know, vote in my place since I can't do it. Um, 
if you are doing relational organizing all on your own, awesome. If you're getting a group together or you're doing the phone list, you will want to have either a full on script or at least provide some talking points, some guidance so that people feel like ready to do this and they know what to say. I also think it's really good to do a little role play um, and practice before you actually get started. So some talking points that we know are really effective. Um, you know, we believe democracy works best when eligible voters can participate. You know, you can safely cast a ballot this year if you're, whether you're doing it by mail, in person, early or on election day, there is a way for you to do it. And, um, you know, we're hearing a lot of, we've seen a lot of expansion to vote by mail and a lot of pushback around that. But if we take a bigger picture stance, um, there have been a lot of changes to vote by mail. And in every election, we see hiccups, like literally every single one. A machine doesn't work. Um, you know, the lines are too long. People aren't on the rolls. You know, these aren't good things. Our election officials are working very hard to minimize um, any sort of errors or uh, problems that arise at the polls or during the polling, uh, the voting process, but things do happen. And so voting by mail may not go perfectly this year. Um, I, I have full faith that this will be, um, a, you know, a, 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 sorry, an election with integrity, an accurate election. Um, but if you, I would say if you're hearing like pushback against vote by mail, I would talk about all the states, red and blue, that already do vote by mail and that it's a really um, popular and growing form format for voting. It increases turnout, it's cost effective, and I don't think it's going to go away, you know, after just this election, um, because people are going to realize that it's actually super easy to just vote from your kitchen table. Um, we've seen awesome PA, uh, PR campaigns like vote naked uh, from your bathtub or wherever you are because you're home. Um, it's it's a really great way to vote and we've been using it for a long time and um, we had to put it together really quickly this year, but I think it's it's actually been a great opportunity because we're going to have more and better voting by mail in the future. And so when you do come up against, um, whether it's misinformation because somebody has, you know, doesn't fully understand how voting by mail works or they've heard others, you know, express concerns about it. Um, I think it's best that we center our own experiences and values when we're talking and that we really avoid the terms that we're hearing a lot like in the news. So voter fraud, ballot harvesting, rigged election, when you repeat these things, even when you're trying to debunk them and you're saying, you know, we don't have voter fraud, there are actually only like 0.01% of votes um, by mail in the last several years. I think that's a statistic, correct statistic. Um, you know, it's so it's not fraud, you know, but ballot harvesting isn't happening. There was only this one example of that, but don't like people aren't really um, trying to hear that, trying to hear you push back on those things. So when you lead with values-based messaging, uh, that's more effective than repeating back the, their terms because uh, when you, whether we're talking about the algorithm on social media and repeating it or just having it, I think, just exist in the air and in conversations, it's, you're actually, yeah, just like spreading it. Um, and so when we, when we switch frames, um, we can do a lot more to uh, not just convince, but make people feel secure about the election and comfortable and um, trusting in that process. Caitlin, any tips on people who, um, you know, feel like their vo voice just doesn't matter? Like, I'm just one person, my vote doesn't matter, why should I turn out? Like, do you have any tips on things that really resonate with those types of voters? 
I would say it really all depends. Um, it depends on that voter and it depends on the messenger. But um, there are a lot of folks who say they d either don't like the candidates, they their vote doesn't matter, or they think the system is corrupt. And those were the three most cited reasons for non-voters who didn't participate uh, in the 2016 election. So some of the things that I would counter with are, um, you know, it's not just the, the most high profile race. There are races all up and down the ballot. Um, and those lower races, those down ballot races really are decided by far fewer votes. So, you know, statistically your vote, vote matters like a lot down there. Um, so your vote does matter. I also would say that even when your candidate doesn't win, you, you know, it was still important for you to have a voice. Nobody registers a non-vote as a protest. Nobody says that person didn't vote, that they must be angry about the system and so we need to change the system. They just see someone who's not engaged. So I don't think it's an effective form of protest. I think that, um, you know, we want to, we want to participate. And even if you don't like your choices right now, um, consider running for office yourself, <laughs> um, getting people around you to run and just learning more about these races and, um, you know, what folks are doing. There's this great campaign um, in Atlanta and in Georgia right now to get um, black men to vote because there's not a registration gap, but there's just a participation gap there. So there's been this great series of PSAs um, featuring dancers from some of the um, clubs that are nightclubs um, in Atlanta. And they talk about like, you know, you elect your district attorney, like that has a huge impact on your life. So really connecting it to people's experiences so that they see that there is somewhere that they can have impact. And we can also connect it to history, right? So John Lewis passed away um, shortly, you know, not long ago, and he was a huge champion of voting rights. This year marks the 100th, cent um, the centennial anniversary of uh, women being given the vote. So that can also be a compelling argument as it is a way to honor uh, the legacy of those who came before us, our ancestors, um, and, you know, to show up that, to say that, you know, I'm part of this community and I matter. Those are great tips. Yeah, so there are some things that you do want to avoid though. So um, everything I say, I try to make it really positive because what we found is that the negative stuff doesn't work. Um, so I took a, some points from um, the Students Learn, Students Vote Coalition. They had a round table discussion. They were really talking about um, voting and especially communities of color um, and with the black community and a, a lot of the messages that have been used uh, to try to reach them or just messages about the black community and voting or about young people and voting and really what they found is that um, things that are blaming shaming or attacking um, just don't work so uh, you know, you shouldn't try to use those negative tactics to pull people in. Um, and there's lots of other options uh, for, for positive messages uh, that are more effective. And later I'll show you some like graphics and fun stuff that you can use so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Okay. So um, some of us might be getting zoomed out, but virtual events are still another great thing that we can do. Um, you know, you can host it on Zoom, Facebook, Google Hangout, you know, incorporate it into something you're already um, doing. If you have, even if you just have a 
weekly or bi-weekly Zoom with friends. I have a couple of those. Just like take a couple minutes to be like, hey, let's just, we're all like good to vote, right? Let's just take a few minutes together to all check our registration. Because sometimes it goes inactive. Finding our, find our polling place, research the ballot, apply for a mail-in ballot if it's needed. Um, really push others to, to actually take that time to do it in that moment, um, I think is like a really good way to make sure that um, it actually happens for people, right? You know, helping them make this plan. Um, and it's just more social, right? So we're social animals. You know, we know that, um, you know, when you're voting with other people, uh, lots of people talk about being taken to the polls with their family when they're young. Like these are positive experiences that help reinforce that voting is part of our identity. Voting is like something that we do and it's, you know, it's the norm and not the exception. Um, and so if you need fodder for any sort of events, next week is Voter Education Week and you can sign up um, on their website if you wanna be a partner. And it's lots of partners, including some I just mentioned um, earlier that work closely with Nonprofit Vote. Um, and all week, we're just making sure people are vote ready so that they, they're making a plan, um, they've got their, they've applied for their mail ballot or filling that out, um, that they know what's on their ballot and that they're really getting their friends and family and extended networks engaged as well. So they have all this great content um, and more is being added constantly. So, you know, uh, these look like, uh, they, um, sorry, Instagram stories, like for your phone. So check out these, you know, get them fresh from uh, the Voter Education Week website, and then you won't have to be reposting other people's Instagram content. You'll be coming in with the, you know, the cool stuff that everyone wants to reshare. All right, so um, whether you work for a nonprofit or a company, we've had Levi's, Target, uh, Blue Apron, all these, uh, Patagonia, REI, all these organizations really getting, uh, companies really getting involved in voting. Um, and we created a staff time off to vote um, library of resources. Um, so really trying to engage uh, the people you work with around voting is a nice, uh, a nice touch and a nice place. Um, I feel like I'm spending way more time with my coworkers than anyone else in my life these days. Um, so just, yeah, Same. making sure they're, they're all set. And then, um, the last one I really wanted to hit is just put it everywhere on your online presence. Like I would love, I would love it if I got on a webinar or something and somebody's name tag just said, are you registered? Um, put it in your social media, put like links at the top or um, you could put it in your signature for your email. You can, um, get your nonprofit organization or business or whoever you're affiliated to put it on their newsletters, just really between now and the election, just make it so that you can't miss it, right? Like Facebook and Twitter and other social media uh, platforms are doing that as well. Um, so you can match sort of that um, with your own content so that, you know, no one can say like, oh, I didn't see that. Um, we want to reach everyone. Um, so I think that is the end. That's the end of my slides. Yeah. Craig, any of the rest of uh, our, our participants, anybody have any questions? I have one while we, we wait. I saw Craig just unmuted though. So Craig, yeah, do you have a question? Go ahead with yours. 
I was just going to ask Caitlin. Um, so we've you've talked a lot about voter turnout and participation and just getting involved in the process. Um, and you know, I have my own own reasons, but maybe we ought to make sure that people understand. Like, why is voter turnout so important in the first place? Like, why do we need people to turn out to vote in at all? Great question. Um, a graphic I've seen going around a lot, um, and I recommend looking at the Knight Foundation's 100 million project. Um, if you compared who voted for Donald Trump in 2016 to who voted for Hillary Clinton for president compared to who didn't vote at all, who didn't vote at all won. Like, more people didn't vote than voted for either candidate. So clearly not everyone's voices are being heard. And I think we're seeing that also play out in sort of the divisiveness and rancor of our political environment right now. Um, voter engagement to me is a totally like nonpartisan thing and wanting higher voter, voter turnout is nonpartisan. It's all completely legal. Um, we have, rules and laws that say that people, certain people can vote. And so we want to have everyone participate and we want to have, every, we want to reduce those barriers to participation. Um, because some of it are that, you know, it's hard to understand the rules. Some of it is that people just don't think that their voice matters. Um, but I think, you know, we've seen turnout sort of go down uh, over relatively um, over a certain number of years. And I think that's also matched the way uh, our society has sort of looked at elections. Um, and if we were all participating, um, we'd ha probably also have more options and more leaders to choose from. Um, when people keep falling off and it's just the same people making the decisions, um, that's how you get sort of something stagnant. That's how you make huge groups of people on either side really feel disconnected from this process. Um, so I think the way to overcome that is to buy in, to opt in, to vote, rather than decide to step away from it, because uh, it's not going to get any better when we step away. Craig, did uh, you have a question? Uh, yes. Um, uh, first of all, Kayla, I want to commend you for an outstanding presentation. The slides were great. Uh, your articulation of everything was great. So uh, I have a question for a professional attorney out the vote. Uh, naturally, uh, I guess everyone here would agree that our democratic system is under an enormous stress test right now. And the attitude I'm often encountering is that people just don't want to hear about the election anymore at all. They, they would prefer to fall asleep like Rick Van Winkle and just wake up when it's over. Uh, have you encountered a similar attitude? And if you do, how do you counter that? Um, yes, that definitely exists. Um, I would say one way to counter it is, you know, be clear, you don't want to talk about the candidates. You're not, you know, your goal is not to debate anyone or to convince anyone um, on how they should vote. You just want to make sure that, uh, they have all the um, information about the process of voting so that they're, you know, they won't be disenfranchised. Um, so I, I think it really matters who you're talking to um, because it's not going to be the same message for everyone. But yeah, I think being very clear about your intentions that it's not to sway someone and it's actually like, hey, let's have this conversation now for like three minutes so that I can sleep better because I know you are like ready to vote. You're hashtag vote ready. I don't care who you're voting for. I just want to make sure that if you needed a mail-in ballot, you know how to apply for one. 
Um, and, and then I can be out of your face and then we can talk about anything else other than the election. Um, so that was a, a tactic we used around census is we tell people like, just fill out the census and then no one's gonna knock on your door. So it's like, just get like, vote now, vote early, get it done and then you don't have to like think about it or talk about it. Yeah, I always take the squeaky wheel approach, Craig, if it's someone that's close to me. I had a roommate who had never registered to vote and um, that was really mind blowing for me because I was so excited to vote when I turned 18. Um, and he soon learned that there was going to be no conversation that didn't start out with us asking if he was registered to vote. So um, I don't think he loved it some days, but you know, I, I know that there's good research out there too, that if somebody just votes into consecutive elections, like the chance that they continue to vote is really, really high. So, you know, it's, it's frustrating to hear that people don't want to hear about it, but that's, that's my take on it is just be the squeaky wheel. If it's somebody you, who, who loves you and has to be around you. Uh since I guess uh, I'm VIP uh, for you know, at least this one very, very rare uh, Zoom meeting, uh, if I can ask a second question. Yes, you uh, may. I assume by definition that, that the mere fact that we're here is that we're highly atypical. We take democracy very, very seriously. You're doing it professionally. And I do it as a very, very serious amateur. But we're anomalies. The vast majority of the public you know, doesn't share our interest in this. Uh, how is it, as you said, like you were excited when you turned 18 to vote. I felt the same way. Um, it was always shocking to me when people didn't seem to care that they were allowed to do this. Is there ever been a way that you've been able to counter that attitude effectively? Well, I think we're it's talking- It's kind of a nebulous question. Well, we're talking, I think, a lot about young people right now, right? And, you know, okay. you're, you're getting the, the right to vote. Um, we know voting is a habit forming behavior. So if you vote when you're young, when, you know, that first election, um, you're probably going to continue voting. Um, so Ideas 42 um, and the um, circle at, at Tufts, um, have both done really great research on um, convin or convincing or pulling in young people into voting and some of the barriers. So um, first, there are some barriers that we have to recognize and work to, to, to counter. So some of it is that young people don't have a good civics education and so they don't um, maybe know about the voting process or it hasn't been presented to them in a way where they really feel you know strongly about this right. Uh, there's also the fact that our voting systems are um, so we have the elections system and you know frankly like those offices and like the poll workers tend to be older, tend to be whiter, they don't necessarily match the demographics of our young people in this country right now. And so young people need to see more people like them in those spaces. So, you know, being poll workers, but also just going to vote. So the, some of the research um, from Ideas 52 showed that young people really like to um, you know, see other people and have that be part of their identity. Like if no one's talking about voting in their sort of group, they're not going to think about it. Um, if they see their peers and people they look up to engaging in this conversation, that's where they're going to want to be at. So it, it sort of could be distilled if the cool kids are voting, then I want to do it too. Yeah, I think so. And so that's why we were really excited when, um, uh, last Tuesday, National Voter Registration Day, Taylor Swift, like, put out a voting guide. Um, and so, you know, that's why we do a lot of work to try to get influencers and celebrities to really push this message. Um, but there's also a lot of really incredible, very politically committed young people. And I would not count out these 15 million uh, young people who have come of age to vote since 2016. Uh, that's a tremendously complete answer. Thank you. 
Yeah, I love that answer. Um, I we've been on such a on a positive spin, and I know we talked about how important it is to to keep the message positive. But there is something that I I wanted to ask about, um, just because you know the news cycle and things. So. Um, you know, election integrity is on everyone's minds, and um, we've talked a lot about vote by mail, but in the last 24 hours, there's also been some discussion of, you know, just the security of the polls themselves, and um, talking about that process, and, um, you know, what roles poll watchers play, and things like that. So I'm curious, you know, I, I know that you all are all about trying to get people out to vote, but are there any resources that you could direct people to so they know what their rights are when they go to a polling center and th- they know that like they're not being intimidated or anything like that? Absolutely. Um, I love the election protection hotline. Um, I believe it's 866-R-VOTE. Um, and they also have yeah, 866 our vote and they also have um, hotlines in Spanish, various uh, Asian languages, uh, Arabic, uh, and more. So, and I, th- I think for, you know, assistance for people with, um, who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, so if you run into a problem, if anyone runs into a problem or sees something concerning, like have that written, you know, in Sharpie on your hand, you know, speed dial on your phone, um, that is the number one resource I would direct you to. And then just for general questions leading up to the election, look at your state resources and get in touch with your county election office. Um, I saw a discrepancy when I was voting by mail in um, in Somerville, Massachusetts, and um, it appeared there had been like a little glitch um, with this ballot tracking system. And so I called them, got it sorted right out. It was really easy to do. Um, so your local elections office, like people work there, they're happy to help you. They wanna answer these questions and they wanna instill the greatest confidence possible um, for you. And you know, if you haven't, signed up to be a poll worker and that's something you're willing to do, you know, do that. Um, there, there is poll watching and, and other things, but uh, that if you want to take part in, you can. But my, my number one thing would be to make sure that you have 866 R vote memorized and that everyone you know does too. Perfect, that's, that's great. Does anybody else have any other questions for Caitlin? Uh, I'll offer, if I may, a third question, uh, which is this. Um, I love Pennsylvania. It's my hometown. It's a great, uh, wonderful place. Uh, As I'm sure all of you know, we're ground zero this year, uh, not only in terms of possibly the tipping point for the Electoral College, but also because of issues with voting irregularities, naked ballots. I'm sure you heard that naked ballot term already. Is that familiar to you guys? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's it's so interesting to me to be in a group where people have heard of that and they all know what that is, you know, as opposed to just political junkies. So. Uh, but we're looking here, it, if there's anything your organizations can do to try to keep an eye on what's going on in, in our state, because I, I do have very serious concerns that they are going to, to attempt to, to quite literally disenfranchise thousands of otherwise cal- validly cast ballots on technicalities. I don't know if there's any particular way you can keep an eye on our state or if you're not, you're probably already doing everything you can do, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, I know there's a lot happening in Pennsylvania. That was my webinar number two of today um, with Participate PA. And, oh, really? Um, yep, and PA Votes, which uh, is a program we're doing um, with the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania. We've got 23 um, organizations there. Um, working with voters. And I know that elected officials in Pennsylvania just did a really fun sort of PR stunt, uh, which I normally wouldn't like, but they did. It was about the naked ballots. So they actually posed nude with, you know, the ballots covering them um, to really make sure that you know, to get people's attention and make sure that they were uh, completing the mail-in ballot correctly using both envelopes, the privacy envelope and the inner envelope. Um, And so the one thing I would just say back to you, Craig, is um, not to pick on you because you've been the best webinar guest 
that I've had in a long time. <laughs> but again, oh, we, don't, very to hear that. we want to be really positive in our messaging. So they are going to try to disenfranchise people. Like that's not something that I would necessarily say because the facts are the they are election officials and elect election officials and elected officials. Um, everything's done out in the open. There are open meeting laws. Citizens can have an impact by calling their elected officials um, and also sort of keeping up with what's going on. Um, I think that uh, we, rather than focusing on any kind of voter suppression, we really want to focus on how do we ensure that everyone has the information they need about how to participate in the election? And then this hotline for if they think some, something went wrong so that they can get legal assistance if needed. Uh, because we know this, bat this battle will be fought way more in the courts than in some shadowy back room where voting machines are stored. I see. Uh, uh, great. Uh, thank you for the compliment. Uh, I'll also say too that Aside from the fact that, uh, naturally, I think that you're correct that the positive messaging is better than the negative messaging. It's also a great deal more personally pleasant for me to think about it from a positive point of view rather than a negative point. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for this, Caitlin. This has been incredibly informative. And I know you all focus on nonprofits, but yeah, I think everything you shared was so helpful for us as individuals. And I mean, all of us are parts of groups, right, too. So if we're with an organization that's not doing voter registration, um, you know, it's probably time to start doing that. Yeah, I really appreciate you having me today. Um, and I love sharing this information. Um, we've got just a few more weeks before the election. A lot of people are already casting ballots, but um, there's, there's more work to be done. Um, and yeah, let's just keep a positive attitude while doing it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Caitlin. We really appreciate your time and all the work you all do at Nonprofit Vote. Thanks. All right, thank you, Caitlin. <laughs>